and when people were like, well, what's in Baltimore? Like, what, what, what's so cool about Baltimore? Okay, first of all, quote the Raven, nevermore, <laughs> nevermore. I wasn't too much of a fan of Bella Lugosi as Dracula. I thought he was very goofy. And like, he's like, I don't drink wine. Just in case you're afraid of anything happening in the dark, guess what? There are such things. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Ramirez, and welcome to another episode of the Hit List Podcast, a podcast where me and a guest cross off films from our watch list and discuss them. This is season six, episode six. And today I'm joined by a returning guest. He's a writer, he's a film noir enthusiast, and he's here back again to talk about horror. Welcome, everyone. Uh, give a warm welcome to Alex Vlahov. Welcome, Alex. How are you? Hey, Jason. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me back, man. I really appreciate it. So before we get started, I have two questions for you. Uh, you know, I like to do these icebreakers. Yeah. Um, first of all, how are you? What you been up to? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I have my birthday in a couple days, so last week. Oh, uh, happy birthday. Thanks, man. Yeah, so we've had some birthday celebrations. Saw a bunch of friends yesterday, and uh, uh, kind of uh, her, my girlfriend's birthday is kind of nearby as well. So I uh, had a joint birthday going, lots of outings, and uh, kind of celebrating this week. And yeah, I can't, probably going to go to Big Sur on Thursday, really mm -hmm. beautiful part of California. And uh, very excited about that, man. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what's happening over here. Staying busy day to day and uh, yeah, loving L.A. How about you? Uh, you know, I got a new job a, a couple months ago, so that's been doing pretty well for me. And yesterday I did my first improv showcase and I never done improv on stage before. So that was nerve wracking, but also encouraging at the same time because I got a lot of laughs and people liked me up there. So, who are you doing yeah. it with? Who? Uh, what, what's what school or theater are you uh, doing it with? So it's called the Baltimore Improv um, Group, and it's like a, it's on theater in Baltimore. Uh, cool. And yeah, I took a class. Like with every class, you have to do. It. There's a showcase at the end. So like the last class is also the showcase. So yeah, you know, it was like it's only like friends and family. So like it's the most encouraging audience you'll probably ever get in your life. So. <laughs> Improv so fun. Love improv. Uh, I've done some UCB myself, but it's all, it's just great also just for practicing ease of, you know, conversation in any situation, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah. As an art form, it's so impressive to watch. Big, big fan. They're very cool that you did that. Yeah. Awesome. So I guess my second question for you is, um, I've noticed that you are a huge, not huge, but like you, you visit that, um, that place in LA a lot. What's it called? Like the, they go, they're like the telescope they go yeah <laughs> it, i posted yeah. from there today the observatory the observatory <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a it's kind of a landmark it, well, i mean it's it, it is a landmark in the city and it happens to be uh a short hike from my apartment so it's uh. a, a very easy way to stay fit and you know a try try to stay fit <laughs> and uh <laughs> there, there's like this stairwell it's called there's these stairways this is specific stairwell called the Berendo stairs and then uh, there's a couple after that, and then it just dumps you right into the park. And it, it does feel like uh, nature. It does feel like, you know, you're in wild nature. Um, Griffith Observatory is a really cool, beautiful building. It's like an odd combination of art deco with, like, Greek style. It's, a, right. it's, it's like an interesting clash. Um, and a lot's filmed there. You as a, you know, film buff, you probably know Rebel Without a Cause. Yeah. Uh, Devil in the Blue Dress, um, The Rocket Man, Terminator. A lot of things have been set there. The, fe the ending of Rebel Without a Cause is so you know notorious. That's why there's like a James Dean statue there. Um, uh, it's his bust, and it's a very creepy stat sculpture of his head. It has no eyes. So really, if, yeah. Whenever you come to LA, uh, I'll take you up there, and we'll go look at the uh, the eyeless James Dean statue at the Griffith Observatory. <laughs> so, the thing is, I've only been there once, and it was a few years ago. And I tried to go, but like the trip I was on, um, that same day I went, I was also leaving, so like I had to rush it. So I was like going there. Okay, sights. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Okay, let's go. And so I didn't get to really fully immerse myself with the observatory. And the night before, I was going with someone, and it was closed. I was like, "Oh, it closes at night." 
I mean, it makes sense, but still. <laughs> it's a- yeah, it does have a couple evening hours. Uh, oh, yeah, there, there are so many tour buses that come through. It was luckily, really empty today, midday Monday, you know. So, um, but uh, yeah, man, that's uh, that's the way. That's a great thing to do when you visit. Uh, whenever a lot of people come, I'll either show them that or I'll recommend mm-hmm. that. Uh, you know, it's in Griffith Park is massive. There's the sign. There's the uh, country cowboy museum, the Autry. There's uh, like flower gardens. Uh, Griffith Park is huge, so uh, lot, lots to see in there. Gotcha. So let's get back. Uh, let's get into the discussion of for today. We're actually going back to the old tradition of discussing two movies, but only because I want to discuss one movie. Today we'll be discussing Dracula and Dracula. Excellent. Right. Very I excited. You- I, I also just want to say that before we began, I mentioned that I was not a Dracula fan. I mean, I love. <laughs> Todd Browning and Freaks. I just, it wasn't my universal horror film. I'm like mm. a Frankenstein Invisible Man guy. Uh, and then Dracula, I saw as a kid on VHS. <laughs> and then we also would watch it and when we go to vacationing in this little cabin town called Arnold. So I have like very strong memories of it early on, but I love King Kong, Frankenstein, Invisible Man later. So uh, rewatching it, it's so good. I, I don't know. I, I've, I think it has a reputation of being a bit slow and plotty. Also, there's no music. You probably noticed. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think it has a kind of a static reputation. But I had a really good time revisiting it. Bella Lug- it's all about Bella Lugosi for me. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for asking me to do this. Very, It's an honor and very fun. Dracula is a 1931 American pre-code supernatural horror film directed and co-produced by Todd Browning from a screenplay written by Garrett Fort, starring Bela Lugosi in the titular role. It is based on the 1924 stage play Dracula by Hamilton Dean and John L. Balderston, which in turn is adapted from the 1897 novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. Lugosi plays Count Dracula, a vampire who emigrates from Transylvania to England and preys upon the blood of living victims, including a young man's fiancée. Uh, The film was partially shot on sets at Universal Studios lot in California, which were reused at night for the filming of Dracula, a concurrently produced Spanish-language version of the story also by Universal. The Spanish version was on Jason's list. Jason, why was this on your list? So, I had always known about Dracula. Like, I think we all know Dracula. He's like he's like in the zeitgeist of culture, like just film and literature culture everywhere. And I'd always wanted to watch the old version. And I think a couple of years ago, I was on Reddit and I learned about it. there was a Spanish version that was made that was made at the same exact time. But it's technically and visually looks better than the original because they are able to see the dailies uh, that the English version shot and then just do um, improve upon those when they shot at night for the Spanish version. And I had never heard of a Spanish version of Dracula. I don't think most people have. And I think I think you, when I told you about it, I think you also didn't know about it either. Not a lot of people know about it. And it had, and it had to be preserved once it was found. So that's kind of why. I was just very curious as to, like, how was it better than the original? Because the original, like, I don't want to say original, but, like, the English version is, like, it's, like, a part of our culture, basically. So how was it better? So that was why I was on my list. Excellent. Excellent. I, uh, I did know about it only because BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, did a uh, curated series of uh, Mexican horror films in uh, 2015, 2016, I want to say. And that this Dracula played then. I missed it, unfortunately, but I did ah. get to see uh, Santa Sangre, the Jodorowsky film. And... Um, Oh, a, a film that Guillermo del Toro really likes. Uh, it's maybe something involving a... I don't remember. It's it's a little... It's like Little Girl. It's an evil little girl. Um, there were some great films that played. Um, yeah, I'll send you a list of those afterwards. But yeah, that, the BAM has this, had this amazing uh, Mexican horror series. And this was included. So, And I didn't see it for all these years. It was even on Criterion... Mm. last year yeah i missed it and uh yeah this was a great opportunity to catch up with it yeah and that's uh, that's a great technique that you have of having the guest sort of read the background and then ask the question that's 
great structure. I just want to, yeah, really, really. For the, for the listeners at home, Jason has a great handle on uh, the flow of the convo. So it's, <laughs> it's, you know, I love the behind the scenes podcast stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's great. I, I feel very taken care of. It's great. Yeah, I, I do my best. You know, it's only trial and error, you know. So I guess you you kind of already went over what you what you thought, but like, what do you think of like the both of them? As you you say, you watched them both on the same day. So what do you think as you were watching them? Okay, I watched the Spanish one first because that was new. Um, so unique and a little slower, a little slower mm. is the one thing, and I don't think that I liked their Dracula. I mean, Bela Lugosi is just so magnetic. Um, right. Their, you know, their, their Dracula was, was great. He actually reminded me of Timothy Carey, another old Hollywood actor who was also completely like nuts. A lot of stories about him off screen. But yeah, I, I really dug uh, the different choices made. Things lingered longer. Like the, the I, I, I loved it. I thank you so much for recommending this. Uh, loved it. The, the the biggest stark difference for me was the ending shot, right? Mm, I mean, yes. you notice that where you see Van Helsing that. looking down at Renfield, who, by the way, is also thrown from the stairs versus right. the tumble in the other one, right? Mm-hmm. In the in the in the uh, uh, the Todd Browning version, the English version, he just stumbles down the stairs. The Spanish one, he just throws him over, and that's a mm. steep fall. By the way, yeah. n- no banister on the staircase. Very very dangerous, just in general, to like film, like do anything. So it's impressive that they you know used it and, uh, to such great effect. Um, and the the ship scene, I really preferred in the Spanish mm. version. Oh um, yeah, for sure. So unique, the yet screaming through the porthole, and um, the the English one uses uh, reused footage. I, I found out from a movie called The Stormbreaker. So like mm. all the, the the water spilling onto the deck, and it's kind of sped up. It's from an older film from nineteen. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. That's recycled. Whereas in the Spanish one, you see uh, Renfield laughing through the porthole. Very weird image. And then you do see Dracula. And the reaction of a couple sailors, and it's great. It's very simple. Uh, and then you know they they both have the the steering wheel with the guy, the silhouette of the guy hanging. But mm-hmm. um, no, to answer your question, I I really enjoyed the Spanish version. Um, I don't think I think it has a little bit of hype online of it's better than the it's better than yeah. I, mean, I I think they're both great in different ways. I think that they both have drawbacks as well. You know, um, so you know I find the English one very mute and static because of there is such a lack of music it does feel slow sometimes because of the silence and the pacing um and even more so in the spanish one but then there's interesting choices in the spanish one um you know I, i'm just so used to the bella lugosi one it was great to see this like uh it almost was like you know there was all this obsession with multiverse last year right Mul- films in the multiverse so it was like this like parallel dimension version of dracula uh it was right. yeah Really enjoyed uh, uh, seeing this for the first time. I I didn't think it was on purpose either. Like it was completely by accident. How um, a lot of movies, just in recent years, how many of things are doing like multiverse? Like last year, we had everything everywhere all at once, which was you know Academy Award winner of like almost every category. And then just recently, we have um, across the Spider Verse, which is like a continuation of it into the Spider Verse, where like many different versions of Spider Man. And recently, we had the Flash come out, which I don't want to talk too much about it, but like, even from the start, I just didn't. I was I was not a fan of like the way it was handled. Uh, I think most people aren't. I think that's why it's failing at the box office so bad. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's a really that's a really hard thing to navigate where you can't really publicize or lean on your main guy or your main exactly. star. Exactly. But then you do have to reveal in the trailer what would have been an amazing surprise. If they didn't put it in the trailers, which they had to, because it's like, well, we need people to see it. So, but I don't think, I don't know if their plan was, I thought I, they might've pulled a no way home, right? Where they didn't reveal that, but things being what they were, they had to. And it, it's, yeah, it's just kind of unfortunate all around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's just so much that, that film has been plagued with like. I haven't the, seen it. I, I didn't see it yet. I'm going me to. Me neither. But like. I've been following the production for years since like 2014 when Ezra Miller was first announced to be the flash, like literally a week after the TV show was released, like the first episode. 
and so i've been seeing it basically like a what's it called like a door like a revolving door mm-hmm. of like directors and writers going in and out of like that project across the years and that was just with this iteration of the flash totally yeah yeah so back to dracula <laughs> yeah yeah no happy and also there is a renfield movie this year <laughs> yeah re- more relevant than ever so <laughs> Yeah, I haven't seen that one, but it's got Nicolas Cage as Dracula, so I might have to catch that one soon as well. So what I thought, well, because this was my first time watching Dracula in general, and oh, cool. you, re- I remember like last uh, last time we spoke after the recording, I asked you about like recommendations, and you recommended Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, which I did like Bri- Bride of Frankenstein much more than the Frankenstein one. I just thought. They could have been like edited together to like one more cohesive movie. It could have been like one two hour movie, but I liked how it was just it just improved a lot over the first one. And I saw the Mummy, didn't think too much about it. I think I told you that one. And it was October then, and I was gonna watch Dracula, but I just didn't have time to watch it. So I was excited to watch it, and like you said, it's very mutant static, and I was not prepared for it. And you had to like remember to give it the context of like when the film was made. Right. It's like one the first talking horror movie, and it, it you had to like learn that like they were so used to like silent films, especially Todd Browning how he was a silent film director before this, so he wasn't used to using sound in his films. And there was also some like some philosophy of filmmaking where like they shouldn't they wouldn't use music unless there was music used in the scene, so. Like you, you could hear music during the opera or like the theater that they were in when Dracula's introducing himself to the people. But beyond that, you don't hear any music where nowadays you would expect music or at least some sound design as well. Right. So I saw the Bella Lugosi one first because I was excited to see that one and just compare it against the Spanish version. I didn't know the Spanish version would be like a little longer, but I found both of them very slow. Uh, <laughs> And I wasn't too fan of the slowness, and but I love the set design. I love the acting, and I might be on the unpopular side, which I'm not. I'm not unfamiliar with being unpopular, but I wasn't too much of a fan of Bella Lugosi as Dracula. I thought he was very goofy, and like he's like, I don't drink wine. Yeah, that, that <laughs> line, it's very overplayed. It's very yeah. very overplayed. And there are a few other examples, but that's the one that stood out to me. I did like. Um, I think his name is Carlos, uh, the the Spanish version, Dracula, a little bit more than Bela Lugosi. And when I heard, like, it's better than, like, the English version, I felt like, oh, maybe it's, like, acting is different. Maybe the story is better. No, it's mm-hmm. the same script. The yes. same script. The Spanish and, version does keep in some things where, like, uh, I, yeah, and I even burn the letters, Renfield says. That's one difference. Uh, it, 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 uh, one, a, a detail I really like. Um, that I didn't catch in the English one. I mean, I, I might be wrong, but I, I'm pretty yeah. sure I only read that in the Spanish version. And I think with the Spanish version, I my my family loves like the like the golden age of Mexican cinema. So like they'll have it. They have like the channel specifically for that, like De Película. Uh, I think sure there are other ones, but that's the one that comes to mind. Where it's just like old old Mexican black and white movies, and they love them, and just like. Seeing that just reminded me of that. I'm like, okay, I kind of have like some nostalgia towards like that type of film, that have type you of heard language. Of the in Witch's the film. Mirror. So that's a very no, uh, El Espejo de la Bruja. That's that played in the BAM series. Uh, I need to find that. Uh, ah. Yeah, man. It's uh, it was. I've seen that. I was once at a at a, at a Mexican bar uh, that had like tacos and like it was. It's like a one in my hometown. Yeah. And on TV, they had this like black and white horror film, and then. You know, oh, I was able to look up on, based on the programming, like what it was. It was this movie, and apparently, it's like this, like seminal. Uh, uh, it's a landmark. I'm looking at it right now. It's a landmark film of Mexican horror. Wow. Genre. Uh, that's so cool that your, uh, you know, your parents had that on kind of stuff on. Yeah, but for them, it wasn't. It's like not horror because they're Christian. They don't like horror movies. They like you know, like dramas and romance. Oh, comedies. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, gotcha. What one big fact? What one big guy that my dad loves is comedy. So he mm. loves Cantinflas. He loves Chespirito. Those guys, you know, a travel, but Sabado, yeah, he, uh, Sabado, Sabado Gigante. What is that? The Sabado Gigante. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he used to watch that, but then he finally got too little, too ridiculous later on. So well, that I went for really like that. so long. Right? It was. Like, I remember that as a kid. The the guy with the tiny mustache and the freckles. Yeah, and the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So yeah. overall, for for the film, like I liked it, but I did have some reservations. Like it's very slow at times. Mm. You know. Yeah, that's pretty much what I thought. No, I, I, I hear you. Um, and, you know, slight adjustment. Okay, I just found it. The films that I saw at BAM in this series called uh, Holy Blood Mexican Horror Cinema was, um, oh, I saw this film, Kanoa, A Shameful Memory. That is like students slaughtered that stand up against a dictator. Uh, mm -hmm. Poison for the Fairies. That's the one that Guillermo del Toro loves. It's two, two mm. young girls. It's witchcraft. And then Alucarda. That's like a, a satanic one. That, that I, sounds that was, very familiar. That, that sounds was very... huge. Very influential, apparently. Uh, and Sansa Sangre. I didn't see Kronos. That also played. Oh, yeah. Uh, Witch's Mirror played. El Baron del Terror. Uh, the Curse of the Crying Woman. I didn't see these. Uh, and then La Tia Alejandra. But yeah, I'll send you this link to this lineup. But, you know, if people listening to this are interested in, like, Mexican horror films, hey, there's a couple, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely, that's, Bella Lugosi is a little corny. I mean, especially it keeps cutting back to the eyes so many times, right? Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's what I liked more about the Spanish version is because it wasn't like on the face. It was more focused on the eyes. And it had like, if I remember correctly, they had like a light on the eyes. So like it was like more like hypnotic in a way. Whereas like in the English version, it's just like his face look, looking like this, just eyes wide and like a scowl. And then like, oh, yeah, and then yeah. they're hypnotized. Like, what? <laughs> is this supposed to be a comedy? Is this why there were so many comedy like parodies of this movie? Or like... <laughs> <laughs> And there are so many. I mean, uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It with Leslie Nielsen, right? And then there's the Mel Brooks one. Uh, and then I'm sure Abbott and Costello have met Dracula. I know they, yeah. they, they did the series of horror films, you know. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and all that. Um, uh, yeah, Bella Lugosi, kind of a sad... I'm sure you've seen Ed Wood, the Tim Burton film with Johnny Depp. I'm familiar with it, but I, I don't know... Like it's really school. good. Yeah. It's it, it deals. It's about the 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 cult director Ed Wood from the fifties, who actually worked with a very elderly Bella Lugosi. I don't even know mm. how elderly he was because he was a, he was a morphine addict. Um, really? And, yeah. And in Tarantino's last book, uh, it, it's his his nonfiction uh, book, Cinema Speculation. Great rec great read, by the way, if you have a chance. Um, he talks about this actor who's just like fantastic. He's in, like in uh, Bogdanovich film. Uh, inside Daisy Miller, uh, this guy also like wrote like uh, for uh, a horror film magazine in the in the sixties, maybe the seventies, and he wrote about Bela Lugosi. And Bela Lugosi's morphine addiction was like so bad it like ruined his marriage late in life. She got him very clean and then left him. And then he only wow. lived a couple more years. Yeah, after that, I, I I passed the apartment he used to live at. It is like a very modest apartment. Um, very sad ending for kind of you know for one of the you know icons of. You know, just like a face people know in the horror mm -hmm. genre, you know, yeah. But uh, Ed Wood is a really good representation. That actor, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, which is a bit embarrassing because I really like him. Uh, but he, I think he won an Oscar for that role. So uh, he's in Crimes and, Mis Crimes and Misdemeanors too. I'm forgetting his name. Yeah, please watch Ed Wood if there's one recommendation that's Bella Lugosi related from our chat. Uh, really fun film. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely like I'll keep that in mind. I think, wasn't he like the director that was like always like, Consider like the worst director or whatever. Tim Burton. Oh, Ed Wood. Yeah. Ed oh, Wood, yeah. Horrible, horrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's did some interesting things, Glenn or Glenda, but yeah, for the most part, his stuff is, it's, unless you watch it with like a curious or knowing eye, you know, if you were to just stumble into it, you might think it might be, it's, it might be one of the worst things you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plan 9 so, from Outer Space I have seen. It's not, you know... It, it's actually kind of hard to get through. There there are better bad films. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, you know, f more fun stuff to watch. But his life story is pretty interesting. I guess we can talk about, like, the more technicalities of this film. So the main difference between both of them is the camera work and technicalities. So were there any moments in the film that you were noticed were significantly different that you thought were... Not ne not necessarily better, but like more interesting take that they did in the English in the Spanish version. 
Yeah, there's a moment with the succubi um, where mm. the the three women, the mistresses of Dracula, however you want to call them, uh, kind of encroach on Renfield. And it just reminded me of, you know, the Macbeth, the three witches, or the three fates, you know, in Greek mythology, just these three figures. Whereas in the English one, like, you know, they all kind of come towards him. And then Dracula kind of stands up and bats them away. I really like the Spanish version's take on that scene. I think I mentioned the shipwreck. Uh, I think I mentioned the, the final shots, uh, preferring the Spanish version. I liked the mirror scene a lot in the Spanish version. Noticing yeah. that it's, the editing of that, it's great. Just kind of looking behind him. Yeah, it's very subtle. It's very, very obvious in the English one. He like yeah. t- he taps Jonathan Harkness or in, in the Spanish one, Juan Harkness. Uh, you know, and I think it's Eva instead of Mina. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really funny because like uh, I was thinking that the, unfortunately R. Kelly song, uh, they like I'm thinking like the Weird Al version where he's like, and he looks at me, and I look at her, and he looks at me, and I look at her, and like just because of like the English version, it's like okay, we get it. He's not visible in the mirror, right? But, like they keep going with it. Like you could have been a little bit more subtle, and then I guess like the director for the Spanish version saw is like, okay, we could do a little. We could be more subtle with it, and he was more subtle with it. And I, I'm very nitpicky in the sense of like, I noticed it immediately, like such as like that editing version, but also with the shipwreck, when in the English version when he transitioned into the ship, they do like, and now they're traveling to England, you know, mm-hmm. like the little the letters on screen. Whereas in the Spanish version, it just cuts immediately to to them on the on the ship, right? So there's no like transition sort of way it just cuts to them on the ship i'm like okay there we go modern editing you know <laughs> so yeah that's like one major thing and then there's also like when dracula is first introduced in the english version he's like you know it's like a wide angle establishing shot of him like going coming down the stairs whereas in the spanish version it's like a tracking shot the camera comes towards dracula uh as up the stairs and yes. introduces himself himself yes. That it's was so a major funny. difference. The camera is almost like seduced by Dracula going towards right. it. Right. That's a great way of saying it. It's very static. The Todd, the Todd Browning is very still camera. Not exactly. Very, it's, it, which it works in a lot of cases because then there's a lot of negative space and uh, darkness. And it really, it really focuses the single... It's almost like an Edward Hopper painting where it's just like a person in a window or one figure. It, they're very lonely. Uh, there's something very right. lonely about Yeah. Uh, his work's really interesting. He did some silent films uh, that I just really love. Uh, one of them is The Unholy Three with Lon mm. Chaney, uh, sort of a circus-related one. Uh, there's the, the, the best one is uh, called The Unknown, which has uh, Joan Crawford when she's like, Oh, like 19. It's like might, might be one of the first things she did. And, it, and she's with Lon Chaney and he throws knives with his feet. What? And there's, <laughs> there's this ending where she's like on a spinning wheel and he's throwing knives at her. Uh, Todd Browning is so carnival circus influenced. Then he does freaks, which is what he's very famous for. Uh, and Dracula, obviously, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, I really love his work. Um, I'm just, you know, kind of like, Looking at Letterbox, some of the other things I've seen, like Mark of the Vampire, The Devil Doll. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if there's another, if you really like his style at all, um, I would recommend The Unknown. Or Freaks is very famous because, you know, you could just never make a movie like that. Um, that's pretty singular. Yeah, I, I mean, other differences. I do think that, like, this, there was a couple shot, shots in the Spanish version that made me laugh on accident. Like, it would cut to Van Helsing and he'd have such eyes wide. It was... Uh, like so startling and then also one, at one point i reached over for water and because it's it's i i know a little bit of spanish but not as much as you know i i do need subtitles and i heard the word right. i kept hearing the word pesadilla pesadilla and the first time it was mentioned i thought it was quesadilla so <laughs> so i was like what are they talking about and then okay nightmare 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 
Gotcha. It, re- it just because I looked away and I wasn't reading the subtitles. Uh, but that, I get it. I get that it. That caught me off guard. Uh, but now I know how to say nightmare, which is great. <laughs> you know, please name this uh, episode uh, Nightmare Quesadilla if you want. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds excellent. <laughs> well, watching these but, in one day was kind of like a Nightmare Quesadilla, you know, Dracula, Dracula. But um, uh, yeah, man. It, the, and then the final shot, like I said, uh, just those differences. Oh, more music in the Spanish version. Whenever he rises mm-hmm. from the coffin, plays yeah. his music yeah and also you don't even see that in the english version you don't even see him rising it's just the hands and then exactly yeah that's that's what i thought was gonna happen in the english version like i thought that was like the iconic like him rising from the coffin but no they don't even show that it's just like a hand and then cut and he's already up out of the coffin right yeah and they that's like a major difference for like in the spanish version it's like the same hand cut you know like hand and then you see as the coffin opens, there's fog and there's light coming from the coffin. And then Dracula slowly rises from the coffin. And he's just like this ominous figure. Like, oh, who is this guy? He's that guy. So that's what I really liked about it. Like, And I guess like some people took inspiration from that in like later films. I don't know where, but like I've seen that type of like move somewhere. But like I guess it was inspired from this one specifically. It, so. it also might be the uh, you know Christopher Lee famously played Dracula in a ton of those hammer yeah. hammer horror so there might be a specific shot where he just sits upright you know but I I mean it was also I mean great to also just kind of brush up on my Spanish I mean like I <laughs> I took it in in school and like because I was able to like understand like a lot of words and I was like oh yeah so like I mean for anyone who is trying to remember it like watching these two versions is actually like a really helpful way i found it really uh you know i understood a lot more than i thought i would so there was also that fun aspect of it too i i don't know if i prefer one more than the other uh, because i watched them in the same day i almost kind of like right. consider one 1931 experience i mean shot in the day shot in the night same set i mean that's so rare i know they did it for a couple other films too but i, I don't know which ones so me neither yeah. it was a very short-lived experiment of like doing this because it was done before dubbing was really reliable right and so that's something i learned when i was watching like the documentaries about dracula how they had like a huge latin american market for like films and it was easy to translate them because you just had to like change the translate the words right but the, the scenes will stay the same like the picture will stay the same and then once it t- became like talking movies, they had to be like, "Oh, how are we gonna, how are we gonna market this?" <laughs> so that was like one one solution they came up with, like just film different versions of the same movie, but with different actors with in different languages. And this is one of the most popular ones that survived because it was the creators of the Spanish version took more creative liberty with it, and I don't think people really noticed. Um, I, like at the time, or if they did, they probably didn't care. Oh, well, I, I doubt. I You know, studio oversight. I mean, the director didn't even speak Spanish. He didn't, no. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, his, uh, he, sa- he sounded like an interesting guy. George Medford. He, he's really famous for directing that Rudolph Valentino silent film, The Sheik. Uh, because Rudolph mm. Valentino died, like, super young. As I'm sure you know, he was, like, the first, like, teen idol, like, dead early, uh, you know, people were in love with him and mourning him. Like a James Dean, Heath Ledger, legacy type type thing, right? Rudolph Valentino was the first in the silent era. The Sheik was mm. his biggest film. Same director as the the Spanish Dracula. Uh, uh. That, yeah, that's a huge silent film. And uh, he also, he, he liked being in entertainment so much that eventually he kind of stopped directing but would continue act. Uh, acting in films so he was in a couple Preston Sturges films and you know Preston Sturges has done like uh, Sullivan Tra- Sullivan's Travels and uh, uh, so many great uh, sort of screwball comedies so I-, I wonder which ones George Medford's been in I need to go back and see just interesting career from this guy so I feel like we kind of like talked enough about like what we thought about the film uh, unless there's like any final thoughts before I go into the production of the film like what went into it i'm looking at this to see if the i mean the the shots of the lady in white walking in the darkness in the spanish version is so good that is i think what i had about the version yeah i mean i'm sure going through my notes here uh yeah that's most of what i thought about the film a lot of uh, i mean i find what interesting is around the film that it was like kind of hard to see for so long uh, it was in Cuba, and also a lot of people have different dialects in this film, so it's like different clashes, different versions of Spanish. 
um, a part of it was missing. It was released in VH1, VHS in 1992. It was kind of not really available for most of the 20th century. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm just very glad it's been reclaimed. Oh, one thing I do want to mention. Carla Lemley. Uh, there's two people. Oh, that, yeah. She's in both. She's the only person in both. There's, a, there's an actor. Really? Yeah, yeah. There, there is an actor who is, um, I, I believe, a little person. Um, he, he says Nosferatu, the Spanish version. I, he's in the English one, too. But someone who, like, has a lot of dialogue in, in both is... She's the in the, the, the stagecoach at the beginning, reading the yeah. facts of the glasses. That's Carla Lemley. She lived to be, like, over 100 years old. And she's mm-hmm. the only person that really has, like... You know, she's seated, I think, closer to the camera in the Spanish version in the beginning stagecoach. She's deaf. I remembered her from the English one. Um, related to, you know, Carl Lemley, you know, who was, you know, a major producer at the time. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's just a fun connection. And something I learned about her is that she, her opening line, she's the first person, like, to speak the first lines in a talking horror movie. Like, wow. First wow. person ever. I'm like, yo, that is really cool to see, like to to even know about that fact. She's the first person to ever speak lines in a in a horror movie. Love that. I love. It's like the first uh, zombie in the um, uh, Night of the Living Dead. That one guy, he got famous. He would go to comic cons later. But yeah, that one guy, he's that's him in the black and white. That that one tall guy. <laughs> yeah. So actually, there are a couple of things. Um, I did write some notes. I thought was really funny. I thought like there was some great use of shadows. And I don't remember which in which context it was, but I do remember like enough that like I wrote that down as a note. And what was it? I said it makes much more sense that Dracula seduces the maid to move the wolfbane. I guess because I was confused as to like how the wolfbane was moved in the, in the English version that somehow it made more sense to the Spanish version. But mm. I also wrote, damn, Amy looks kind of sexy. I'm like, okay, Jason. <laughs> well, she that actress, very... she's, she's great. Yeah, uh... she was really good. She's fantastic. Let me. I just want to bring up her name. Um, she she is in the I think the first uh, Spanish speaking uh, non silent film, Lupita Tovar. Mm, Lupita. She, right. she she also lived uh, she, uh, up to twenty sixteen. Long time. She's in Santa, which is one of the first Mexican sound films. Mm, yeah. Okay. Lupita Tovar. She she very prolific. Worked a lot uh, in a couple major films. Santa. Dracula, uh, and yeah, lived a long time. So yeah, so and also like the way they use the catacombs in the final scenes in the Spanish version, it just looked like better framing. Mm. Uh, they used like a doorway to like frame a shot that I really liked. That was a great use of like what they had, and that final shot that was my favorite shot in the whole f- film because it was like um, Ben Helsing looking down at Renfield, and then John and Ava just going up towards the light. It kind of like signifying like they're going up to to like heaven, not heaven necessarily, like to the good side, like they're leaving the evil. There's like and wedding chimes that play, kind of. Yeah, like bells. It's, yeah. So I I really like that. That could be like a screenshot. Like that could be like a wallpaper. I could I could like frame like right here. So I that was like one of my favorite shots in the whole film. Completely agree, man. That that shot really. I that's when I was like, okay, now I get why people you know, opine that the Spanish version is better because that final shot really is very powerful. It's such an interesting balance of survival and then Renfield and a, a corpse, you know, and Helsing, <laughs> Bill Helsing just has blood on his hands. He just stabbed a, you know, a vampire to death. So yeah. 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 Good balance. The, the English one, it just shows them descending. It ends so abruptly. It's almost like a Hitchcock film. It just ends, you know, it's like done. We're done. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like I said, I love throwing Renfield over the stairs versus because uh, that's that's brutal. That's like that's like a stone floor. Uh, yeah. Did you notice the armadillos? Yeah, I did notice the armadillos. They were they were very weird. I don't know why they're armadillos in um, what was it, London, England? <laughs> yeah, well, they're in the castle, and it goes back to like an urban legend or I guess folklore myth. I don't really know how to classify it. Uh, misinformation where armadillos would uh bite into wooden coffins and graves and eat corpses so really was, yeah I, there was some association at the time so it might have made sense to audiences then but to us it's just like oh that's weird there's a possum and armadillos and a bug with its own <laughs> coffin so yeah i mean the rats are great that makes sense that's what you expect i mean right renfield makes a huge deal of the rats and the bugs so. ratas ratas <laughs> <laughs> 
He was great. A little overacting, but he was great. I, I both Renfields. Uh, that's you know that's a big big role. Like, like you know, you start off small and then you go just to one hundred. You know, right. <laughs> And now a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about the production. Now back to the show. We're here to talk about the production of technically both of these films, because you can't talk about one without the other. So I said this earlier, where in the late 1920s, Hollywood studios depended on like the successful exportation of their films because it was easy to transport, export silent films, just rewrite it in like Spanish or whatever. It was the development of sound film that they realized we have kind of have a problem, like how are we going to export this? So they decided to do what they do here, like just use the same script, use the same um, set, just have different actors with, from different languages do these roles. So there were like other versions of this film. There was a French version, there was a German version. And then right here we have the Spanish version of this film. So this was directed by George Melford. He was hired to direct um, with actors Lupita Tovar and Carlos Villarias. And Melford, like you said, he, he was an actor who made several directorial credits, including the Ruda Valentino film, The Sheik. So you basically saying all the stuff I was going to say. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, I know like that it. one. I think he, uh, East of Borneo is the only one that I might have heard of his other work. Uh, he, he also did a couple other Spanish universal films. Yeah, yeah. he did. Yeah. He handled all the Spanish versions, even though he didn't speak Spanish, which I find very funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So October 10th, um, he began directing the film, shooting at night while Browning's crew would, Brown, Todd Browning being the director for the English version, he would shoot during the day. So at certain times, they'll shoot on the same set. And the filming lasted a total of 22, day, 22 shooting days. So, so far, they made it for as little money as possible, in her in opinion. And I'm sure it was true, because, you know, it's if you're gonna do different language versions of the same movie, you're gonna spread your money a little thin. Also, this film is a half hour longer than Browning's version, right? And the costumes are different, uh, as noted by Lupita Tavar. She said they are more like low cut, more revealing in a Spanish version, whereas yes. in the English version, yes. it's you, more covered up. You definitely notice that there's a sensuality to her dress. It, I mean, I know King mm -hmm. Kong has come up, it, it did remind me a bit of Fay Ray, her dress, the white low cut gown uh it's much more uh you know revealing than um mina harker in uh the, the, the browning version david j skull he's a film historian in his book called hollywood gothic which came out in 1990 it included footage taken from a print of the film archived in the Cinem cinematica cinematica de cuba which included footage missing from the library of congress that the copy was screened in and he concluded that the film was superior to browning's version so that's kind of like where this, I, I guess where the discussion began where like he was like one of the first people to like discuss like both of them in like in print and like the reception, you know, it's like a lot of good reception towards the like composition and camera movement. It gives it more, more fluid, more sinister mood as some critics like such as Mark Deming of all moving. It is. More fluid. My, it def definitely is more fluid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my opinion, I, I do like it better, but like it's still the same script. I still find it slow, but that's what I had here. And as far as like influences on other notable Draculas, this is both Bela Lugosi and Carlos Villares. Um, Christopher Lee, who played Dracula in the Hammer series, had this to say about Lugosi's Dracula. Anyhow, about the Lugosi Dracula, I was so disappointed. I had absolutely had been wanting to see it for a long, long time. There are, there are aspects of it, for instance, that I considered ridiculous. Dracula is played too nice at the beginning, practically no menace in the character. There's no shock or fright in it. Lugosi stands too... He held them out stiffly, making him look like a puppet. His smell was not always sinister either. And that's the end of the quote. And I felt the same about it. Uh, I was very glad that like, one of my favorite Draculas shares my opinion about like a, a notable Dracula. But, uh, Gary He's a Oldman. little stiff. He is a little stiff for sure. <laughs> oh, Gary Oldman played him. Yeah, that's right. Gary yeah, Oldman. Gary Oldman played Dracula in Francis Ford Coppola's adaptation. And he considered Lugosi to be his favorite Dracula. And instead of his performance... He was really onto something, the way he moved, the way he sounded. And Gary based his Dracula's voice on Lugosi's voice. Hmm. And I like I had that a lot version. Of... I do like that version with Tom Waits as Renfield. That's a fun one. Uh, I basically borrowed a Dracula DVD from the library. And mm. in it, there were like sp a lot of special features, including the Spanish version of Dracula. Oh, great. And... That's great that they included it on there. 
in the Spanish version, there's an introduction by Lupita Tovar. She's like an older lady at that moment. She's mm. like, um, she's a senior citizen at that moment. And she introduces the film in Spanish. And she says, she said both Draculas were similar, even though they didn't re- talk to each other about how they're going to do Dracula. They just somehow ended up doing the same thing. But like, like, like what the way they held out their fingers were different, but like basically kind of like similar in a way. And they actually believed that Pablo Alvarez Rubio, who played Renfield in the Spanish version, they thought he was actually going crazy because he did it so well and he would <laughs> practice by himself. <laughs> he pra- he would rehearse by himself wow. and he never to do it, never needed to do a second take of him because he did it that well. <laughs> if he's rehearsing on, on his own, then I'd imagine it's in the middle of the night. People are tired. He's just talking to himself in the corner. Yeah, I, c- I can understand why people might think there's something wrong. Yeah, and I also saw the it's a documentary called The Road to Dracula where Carla Lamely, she's the host of the of the film. She's introducing oh, cool. it. And there are a lot of notable people like such as David Skull, who I mentioned he's in this in this movie, um, discussing Dracula. And she received fan mail for her role in Dracula. Wow. <laughs> like <laughs> even though she's only there for like a moment. Brief, yeah. She, I, and I, I mentioned this earlier a bit. Um David Skull said this and it, this why that's why I said it because I agree with him. He said, Dracula is quite simply the most media-friendly fictional personality of the 20th century, if not all time. Hmm. Even people who've never read the book or seen the movie will still know exactly who he is. It's very true. It's a, I mean, Nosferatu, I think, is one of the, you know, big early ones. And, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Stoker estate, from what I remember, Bram Stoker, you know, his family wanted all copies destroyed of Nosferatu. Yeah. Because it's just a ripoff of the Dracula story. So uh, it, it, here's my theory, is that like there's so much in arts and literature and history about sex and death combined. And the mm-hmm. idea that like there's this one figure that is very seductive and can kill you, but also give you eternal life, is... Uh, it upsets domesticity in a very alarming way that I think uh, has, you know, intrigued readers, viewers for, uh, you know, well over a century now. Um, you know, the idea that he can literally bite men, women. He's this very alluring, socially pleasant, mysterious figure. Uh, it upsets sort of the normalcy that's established. It's this weird package of uh, sex and death. And, you know, you look at uh la petite mort in france that's the Mm -hmm. you know the word right i mean and then it's all over shakespeare and jacobean uh, plays and uh, you know it pops up vampires you know even the twilight films and it's all just part of it It, it's it's a strong vein in the literary tradition so yeah there's something you know it's like a superman figure uh or uh you know some someone like that it's just a perennial strong societal cultural uh, recognizable i mean you know a vampire usually dracula you know it, it's, it's going to come up every every year there's going to be a new version you know they're, they're, like i mentioned renfield this year you know yeah definitely and um the thing is like the him, him being like seductive and attractive is very it's what started in this movie in dracula 1931 because in the book uh, i'm not sure if you've read the book but um i i listened to the audiobook oh, read cool. by christopher Christopher Lee, oh, very by cool. the way, awesome. yeah, and he's supposed to be ugly, you know. He's mm-hmm. not supposed to be like uh, attractive at all. It, it was just something that they made for the movies, and I guess like they kind of just went with it, and it became his own thing. Where, like you said, like it's synonymous with like sex and death and all that. So I guess it became a, a thing of its own, if that makes sense. Yeah, Gary Oldman. I guess that makes sense why his is so grotesque because it is closer to the novel. I read about half of the novel. Oh, in middle school too, which I probably didn't even understand most of what I was reading, but I liked it. About like the production of this film. So Carl Lamley, he was hesitant to make horror films despite the success of The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera. And it was his son, Carl Lamley Jr., who really wanted to produce Dracula. He grew up watching these movies from Universal and he just loved the macabre. He's what you would call a goth kid, you know, and he wanted Shaney who played the hunchback to play Dracula. And he would have been a very different take on it for sure. But he died shortly before he would be able to play him. So they had to go with finding someone else to play him. And Bela Lugosi seriously fought to play this role. We mentioned like how it's static and mute Todd Browning's version, the English version. It's because Todd Browning had trouble adapting to sound film and 
there are long sequences where there's no sound. It's just silent. And people have speculated it might have been because he was too frightened by the mechanics of the sound equipment to use it. <laughs> so oh, that's one that's one um theory as to like why it wasn't not a lot of sound design in the film. Right, right. Yeah, and, that that totally makes sense. And it was originally gonna be planned to be like a lavish, like big budget production based more on the novel. Unfortunately, there was something called the nineteen twenty nine stock market crash and the Great Depression that this that like stopped them from doing that, so they had to cut back significantly and ended up basing the film based largely on the stage play. And it's shocking to me now because I find him goofy, but people were actually really frightened by Dracula when it came out. <laughs> they were actually yeah, like scared of him. Not only frightened, but also there was this reputation of Bella Lugosi being this exotic lover from a distant land. I mean, it's like. That guy was <laughs> making. <laughs> I'm sorry, like you know what I mean. It's it's um yeah. He certainly casts a certain allure. I mean, you know, it's 1931. I'm sure people have never seen someone like this before. Um, it's just so funny. Yeah, people were scared of him and attracted to him, and um, <laughs> now it's kind of. It, I mean, it's also just so culturally worn. It, it 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 is cool to hear him say the famous lines, you know, I am Dracula. You know, uh, it, it's fun to revisit that. Uh, but it, no, it doesn't come across as scary. Invisible Man comes across as scary. He derails a train, mm-hmm. kills hundreds of people. You know, that's uh, um, it, it Frankenstein once in a while comes across as scary. I would agree about the Mummy. Didn't love the Mummy. Um, mm-hmm. I do like those two silent ones that you mentioned, Hunchback and uh, Phantom of the Opera. That famous taking the mask off scene is still very, yeah. very effective. Um, yeah. Well, I find very funny about the Spanish version is that like Carl Langley Jr. He was very ambitious about producing the Spanish version, particularly because he had feelings towards the leading lady, Lupita Tuvar. And I think they actually got married a couple years later after this production. Like he's like, you know, no, I have to work on this film. <laughs> I have wow. to work on this film. <laughs> so that's why he was very uh, for the production of the Spanish version. Because he really wanted to like get closer to her, and actually got interesting. Yeah, it's really like like these relationships that happen on set. <laughs> no, um, it, uh, the other marriage that I found interesting at this time, uh, George Medford, the Spanish director's uh, uh, wife in life uh, before this film, she, he was married to a woman named Diana Mar- uh, Diana Miller, who mm-hmm. uh, she wasn't in very much, but she uh, I think worked for a bit for Lasky, which became Paramount. And then went to Fox. She uh, married George Medford and uh, died at 25. Uh, I think wow. it was like, yeah, she was in a sanatorium, sanitarium. I never know how to pronounce that. Uh, she had a, a pulmonary hemorrhage, so it was something natural. But she had a pretty rough life. Uh, was struggled for a bit there. Um, yeah, but just one of those like silent film stars that had a died in their mid 20s, had a really short life and kind of kind of rough. But yeah, the, the director was had been married to her, so. Um, I, I just, her, her name came up as I was reading about these people. Just wanted to uh, flag. Oh, this guy also directed uh, The Roundup, which is a fatty mm. Arbuckle Western that's very fun. And that's shot in Lone Pine, which is an amazing California location. A bunch of Westerns are filmed out there. I visited. It's a really cool, there's like unique rock formations. Tons of films have shot out there. So if you're ever in California, Lone Pine, I cannot recommend it enough. Very cool little spot. Gotcha. I'll keep that in mind. And like the final effects right here, because I found them, it was a fitting way to end, fitting way to end the documentary, I guess, fitting way to like close out the discussion of like the production of the film. So Lugosi uh, was pretty much typecast uh, after Dracula. And he said in interviews that the role is like both a blessing and a curse because it gave him so much success, but also typecast him into like basically the same role for movies after that. And what I found very cool was that he was buried with one of the capes from the production oh that's awesome that's so funny he's in culver city uh yeah yeah he's he's buried in la that's that's really really funny i think it's yeah. uh holy cross i think it's called like i could be wrong it has a very sort of you know not a, a huge you know very kind of straightforward name but uh yeah I, yeah one halloween i actually visited because I was in the area, and people leave little uh, uh, bats and little oh, vampire, wow. fake teeth and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. 
Yeah, in Baltimore because Edgar Edgar Allan Poe is from Baltimore. Oh yeah, he's like the patron saint. Yeah, and there was a few a few years ago there was like this, spec like speculation, but like this person would like mysteriously visit him on his like his death, like the day he died, and like would leave like a rose there, Mm -hmm. and people didn't know who he was or whatever, and every year they kind of just expect people like go there and just speculate as he did it. Uh, I read about that when I was in middle school, so I don't know if it's still done or if it became like more of a tradition among people in Baltimore. But that's that's just what it reminds me of. And when people were like, "Well, what's in Baltimore? Like, what what what's so cool about Baltimore?" Okay, first of all, quote the Raven, never more, <laughs> <laughs> never more. Don't make me like wall you up in like in a corner in the basement or something. <laughs> Cask of Amontillado, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, And John Waters, you got John Waters too. John Waters, and I, I really want to meet him. Like, I think it's possible for me to meet him because he, one of my professors, is pretty close with him. Not close with him, but like they know each other. So I love. I do want to meet him. Uh, I love his work. I love all the Poe Baltimore stories. Yeah, he really cuts a large uh, shadow in Baltimore history. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, the marrying his like, you know, in, you know, teenage cousin stuff is weird, but um, yeah, that's we- weird. <laughs> mysterious, uh, mysterious death too, from what I understand. Um, I, I also, I've heard about the rose. I think it's like a, a champagne. Do they leave champagne as well? I think Do they something like toast? that. It's very, it's, and it was going on for like a long time. So they think that it's like the baton has been passed for the person. That, yeah. yeah. I remember reading about that too, man. I, I, I definitely, uh, it's weird. Those, those famous graves that are visited. Uh, I did visit the Jim Morrison one in Paris. That's a very mm. famous one. People do visit that one. Uh, Oscar Wilde is in the same cemetery. Really? I, I, I just happened to be in the you know, traveling and yeah, I saw that one. And then there's uh, all these uh, lipstick marks all over it. So I guess it's like a tradition to kiss that one. So wow. uh, yeah, it's just, just funny. These uh, traditions, you know? So one last fact to close it out, because this is how they actually closed some of the screenings for Dracula. Hmm. When the film was first released, it was accompanied by the fi- a final speech from the, Van Helsing character, not the actor, the character, hmm. where he says that when you go home and are afraid to see a face behind a window, when you turn on the lights, um, guess what? There are such things. Like he said, it's such a, there are such things. Interesting. And that's, that's how they fit. <laughs> huh. Well, because the Frankenstein begins with a, what you are about to see is a, a diabolical, there's some sort of presentational quality to that that film and it's the same mm-hmm. year too so it, it makes sense that they would do that i guess that was kind of in fashion at the time yeah and it's like one of the first movies that like didn't have like a explanation behind it i guess i thought that was pretty cool like pretty funny and goofy like hey just in case you're afraid of anything happening in the dark guess what there are such things <laughs> i mean it, the <laughs> the the vampire there's been concepts going back in so many different cultures in the in Slavic history, there there's a there's a word for it. Um, uh, you know, my parents, my dad's from Croatia, uh, so there's like the the wordalak is famous. Wordalak is like the Slavic folklore version of the vampire. And then mm. you know, you look at other cultures; they have their own versions of sort of blood sucking entities. It's a, it's a very common fear. I think. I mean, I really think it just comes from our you know uh, primate fear of uh, snakes and you know uh, actual uh, you know interacting with bugs and uh, reptiles and a different time for the human species you know Recog- yeah. recognizing that a bite in the blood is bad and the idea oh, of yeah. like a human that does that is crazy right but it, it plays on a very very primal fear that we're probably not really um cognizant of um i'm just sort of like looking at my notes the only other thing i really had here is um when mina is saying in the in the english one i love the fog i love the night and then the she's talking to the bat while jonathan's like what what do you mean on the balcony that is when as a kid i remember seeing in the in the woods in arnold and uh arnold's a very like uh you know, it's very remote at night. It's very, you know, it's, it's the woods. It's creepy. Right. So, uh, I, that actually kind of freaked me out a little bit. And I do remember clocking that scene as a kid, uh, and seeing it again. I, it was like an unlocked memory, you know? Right. So that was really cool to revisit. Yeah. Uh, I, I've seen this is probably the fourth time or fifth time I've seen it in my life. Um, funny to think that those Hills and both are just the universal backlot, which is like <laughs> 
15 minutes from my apartment. Like you do the right. studio tour, like you probably see those hills exactly in those. Um, <laughs> and the bat is hilarious. It's still funny. It's yeah, so, it... <laughs> so cheap. It's so cheap. Yeah, I, I that was about it in terms of um, uh, notes that I had taken. Uh, the uh, fun little Hamlet reference, words, words, words in the English version. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this has been really, really fun. Uh, sort of like going back and looking at these and comparing them, especially I, I, it was almost like a film class, like watching them in one right. day. One day is a really, really interesting way. Uh, you know, you learn a lot, you glean. Uh, it's like watching the, you know, the Alfred Hitchcock psycho and then the Gus Van Sant psycho, I guess, in the same day, you know, um, you know, you really do. You, you, you almost make your own informed choices of, here's how, you know, I might approach this, you know, or here's how another might approach this, right? Like very hands-on way to see a production kind of unspooled um, back to back. So yeah, thanks for asking me on to talk about these. Um, I really, really enjoyed uh, watching both of these. Yeah. So with that, that concludes our conversation today. I want to thank you, Alex, for being on this podcast. I always enjoy it when we talk about films. I always enjoy it too, man. Jason, you're an absolute pleasure to talk to uh yeah thank you so much for asking me back and uh, glad you got to check this off the list so my question for you is um was dracula a hit or a miss with you i oh the spanish version or the english version yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, combined i'm gonna say hit i'm gonna say hit if you if taking both into account yeah yeah i would have to say that as well even though i found it some slow I don't think it was a bad film, either of them, and I liked their different takes on it. It's like seeing having like the same base story, same base set, but taking different directions with it and seeing like what the creativity that can come from based on different visions, you know? So where can we find you on social media? Only Film Noir. That's where I am on Instagram. Uh, might be doing TikToks soon or doing more film history stuff on TikTok. Not really doing that right now. Um, but yeah, and also Alex Blaho, I'm just uh, also available there. Uh, feel free to reach out, always say hi. And, uh, you know, I pop up on a couple of the podcasts too. Feel free to listen to those if you uh, like uh, noir history uh, to talk about. And some horror, I've talked about some horror noir. But this is the uh, really the first time I've talked, you know, straight horror. And very specifically, universal horror, classic black and white <laughs> horror. So, you know, it's uh, very much up my alley. Awesome. So that's it for today, folks. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hit List Podcast. This was season six, episode, yeah, six. My name is Jason, and until next time, cross off a new film from your list. <laughs>